Many of you are interested in nanoengineering because of your interest in contributing to the production and storage of energy. Let me give you two examples in this chapter of the way in which nanoengineered solutions can be used to make products and processes more environmentally benign and efficient, and also ways in which we can store electricity using electrochemical storage, as in batteries. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is catalysis. Now, what is a catalyst? A catalyst is a nanoparticle. Well, <laughs> it's often a nanoparticle. It is a, a particle or molecule or surface that increases a reaction rate. And how does it increase a reaction rate? It does so by lowering what's called the activation energy. So the activation energy is that hill of potential energy that needs to be reached in order for a reaction to proceed downhill into products. It is often the case that the products have a lower potential energy, say Gibbs potential energy, than the reactants, but the reaction doesn't proceed because the activation barrier, that is the way of getting from the reactants to the products, is too insurmountable. It's like getting to an oasis on the other side of a mountain. Even though the oasis is low, you need to increase your potential energy a lot in order to climb the mountain to get there. And there are two kinds of broad classes of catalysts. The first is heterogeneous catalysis, in which we have different phases of matter present in the reaction mixture. Typically, the way this is the, operationally, what this means is that we have a solid catalyst, as in the Haber Bosch process, where you have metal catalysts over which gases are flown. Or you have a uh, you have in a catalytic converter in a car which converts your NOx gases, your unreacted hydrocarbons, and your toxic carbon monoxide into environmentally benign products. You have kind of this honeycomb-like structure that uh, that is coated in this nanoscopic arrangement of platinum, palladium, and rhodium catalysts that affect this transformation at high heat. Those are examples of heterogeneous, heterogeneous catalysts, and they are ubiquitous in chemical manufacturing. And some advantages are that these catalysts can are either stationary, so you just you know take them out and wash them or something, or you can extract them later by um, by uh, filtration or separation in some other means. Some disadvantages of, of heterogeneous catalysis are that you don't typically have a lot of control over the molecular orientation. You don't have a lot of control over stereochemical arrangements of your manufactured products. And for those types of applications, you need something called homogeneous cat catalysis. Homogeneous catalysis means that your catalyst is usually some kind of small molecule or transition metal cluster or something that you put into the reaction mixture. And because it's what's called a coordination sphere of ligands around the metal, say here I've shown the ziegler natta catalyst, which is used to make various forms of stereochemically pure uh, polyolefin type materials. And below I'm showing the Grubbs catalyst, which is, um, which is a way of generating types of structures that have types of polymers that have double bonds in the backbone by taking these ring-like structures and opening them up. It's called ring opening metathesis polymerization, which has the nice acronym ROMP. Anyway, those are examples of, of homogeneous catalysis that give you a lot of control. And these are used widely in the, the fine chemicals industry like pharmaceuticals, for example. But in terms of pure tonnage, uh, homogeneous or heterogeneous catalysis wins hands down. Another 
third class of uh, catalysis is what we would call uh, biocatalysis. And biocatalysis you could use, for example, an enzyme. And an enzyme is a really big molecule. It might actually, it's probably actually in solution. Um, and this is how biological structures, um, or how cells and physiology do catalysis. They use um, they use these uh, these natural catalysts called uh, called enzymes. Now, an enzyme actually can be used industrially as well, and even it can be used in non-aqueous solvents because water tends to hydrate these proteins and forms a little nanoscale shell, and that can be used to uh, to solubilize a protein in a or an enzyme, which is a protein in a non-aqueous or organic phase. You can also use whole organisms like yeast cells to affect industrial biocatalytic processes, which is pretty cool. Next, I want to tell you a little bit about batteries. So everybody learned about electrochemical cells in their undergraduate or high school course in chemistry. Um, and this is sort of the stereotypical type of electrochemical cell where you have a copper plate and a zinc plate where the uh, in a in two baths of electrolyte solution. So zinc sulfate on the zinc side and copper sulfate on the copper side. And you have a porous separator that allows uh, the negatively charged sulfate ions to go back and forth, and you connect both of these metal electrodes to a load, which will be, say it's a light bulb, which will light up when you attach these two uh, electrodes together. And this works basically by reduction of the, uh, of the copper two plus ions, they played out into solid copper, uh, and that's called the cathode. So, um, so cathode, I usually think of the T in cathode as being uh, as being plus. So that's the positive terminal. It's where the uh, it's where the the copper is uh, is is reduced to copper zero. And then on the anode side, you have the zinc, which is being oxidized to zinc. Uh, to zinc two plus, and that electrode actually gets thinner and smaller as a result of the discharging cycle. Okay, now there is, uh, you know, you don't see that many copper <laughs> zinc batteries, uh, probably none in, uh, in everyday operation. And what you're trying to do in this type of technology uh, is to maximize your power density and your energy density. So the energy density is the amount of energy that a, uh, that a solid block of energy containing, potential energy containing stuff contains and your uh, and and you want to co-optimize it with something called the power density so energy density versus power density power density is how fast you can deliver that energy so the absolute best uh, you know, no compromise solution is a gasoline engine right you get all kinds of energy in the form of hydrocarbon bonds that really want to become carbon dioxide and water when you burn them, right? And you can burn them very, very, very fast. Uh, you can have a same kind of energy density, um, or you can have a similar kind of power density, but a very low energy densiter, density in a capacitor. And a capacitor, therefore, is on the, the low end of this uh, uh, Rigoni plot. And in the blue squares or rectangles, you have electrochemical storage of energy. And right now, the best kind of uh, energy storage technology is a lithium ion uh, battery. And lithium ion batteries have a similar kind of structure to, a, um, to other types of batteries, except that the electrode itself is made of some compound that stores lithium atoms or ions. And it is that storage 
capacity that allows these devices to be packaged in a uh, uh, to be packaged in a convenient geometry lithium is very good at giving up electrons it's also very small so it can be shuttled back and forth between the anode and the cathode quite easily so the anode material is, to, is usually graphite which consists of these graphene sheets that are side by side by uh, side or stacked like pancakes and the uh, and the lithium atoms, so lithium zero, can slide easily in between that uh, those graphene sheets. And then upon discharge, the lithium zero gives up an electron, becomes lithium plus, and then it slides over this ion permeable separator into uh, what's called an intercalation compound that's used in the cathode. And the typical intercalation compound is lithium cobalt oxide. What does an intercalation compound mean? It means that these uh, lithium plus ions have little apartments in that are saved and kept warm for the uh, cobalt oxide structure where those ions can go take up uh, residence and that's the typical discharging cycle and in the recharging or charging cycle it goes in uh, in reverse and there are a lot of ways that a uh, that these materials are still under investigation. For example, the uh, capacity of the graphite anode to absorb lithium atoms is not that great compared to other materials. For example, silicon. So silicon itself can eat like six times its volume in lithium atoms, which is pretty amazing. You could have a huge capacity there. But the problem is that expansion and contraction tends to, uh, tends to wear out the device because you get cracking because of all that kind of like breathing upon uh, upon uh, charging and discharging and on the cathode side the reliance on cobalt is quite problematic because cobalt is a uh, what's known as a conflict mineral it's really only found in well it's found in greatest abundance in places that exploit child labor and uh, and uh, other pretty evil practices so there is a lot of um, there's a lot of interest in developing these types of storage technologies given especially the regulatory and environmental um, contexts of electric vehicles and uh, electric aircraft even and so forth so i hope this gives you a nice primer on energy uh, conversion and storage technologies and catalysis and i'll see you next time